Nikisha Randolph. I'm a mental health counselor, and I'd like to welcome you to this session on mental health first aid. If there are any questions about any of the content that is discussed during this presentation, on the very last slide of this presentation, I have my contact information, my email, as well as my work contact numbers. Please feel free to submit any questions or call me with any questions that you may have regarding this presentation. So let's jump in. When we think about mental health first aid, we're thinking about it in the same light that we would provide first aid to someone who was in a medical crisis. So just like a medical crisis, uh, we have mental health crises and it's important that we are all in some way, shape or form have trained or have some sort of knowledge, working knowledge of how to treat someone and offer assistance, excuse me, offer assistance to someone who may be having a mental health crisis until further assistance can be given to them. So mental health first aid is the help offered to a person developing a mental health problem or experiencing a mental health crisis. The first aid is given until appropriate treatment and support are received or until the crisis resolves. Let me start off by also saying that when someone is administering mental health first aid, they are not acting in a role as a therapist or as a psychiatrist, a counselor. You are only offering tips, uh, things that are helpful to build their coping skills or, and or strategies until treatment is available um, by a mental health professional or by a psychiatrist or whatever the next level of care is for them. So I just wanted to put that disclaimer out there, just like first aid, uh, physical first aid when someone is hurt, you're just doing the necessary things right then and there to help the person. And it's the same thing with mental health first aid. You are not responsible for their treatment um, all you are doing is making sure and offering that person assistance and help until the appropriate treatment arrives and support um, that they need from an actual professional. So why mental first aid? Um, as I mentioned before, just in our last slide, um, just like with physical problems or crises that happen that are medically um, related, um, there are times when people experience challenges and um, emergency situations that they just cannot handle. It could be anything. It could be grief. It could be someone, um, you know, helping someone who um, is talking about, you know, suicide. Um, it can be a number of different challenges that they are experiencing. And so it's really, really important that they receive the help and the support that they need. And we also know that mental health problems are common. Everyone, had, and let me differentiate between mental health and mental illness. When you think about mental health, you're thinking about the psychological well-being of someone. And so anyone can experience a mental health challenge. Anyone can be stressed out. Anyone can experience sadness. It does not mean that they have a mental illness. When you're thinking about a mental illness, you're thinking about a diagnosis, you're thinking about someone who has been diagnosed with like bipolar or someone who has been diagnosed with psychosis or something like that. So you're not treating a mental, excuse me, you're not working to um, alleviate a mental illness. You're working with someone who's demonstrating a mental health challenge. Um, a lot of times stigma is associated with mental health problems. Um, I don't want to tell anyone what's going on with me because I don't want people to think I'm crazy or I'm weak minded or something is really wrong with me. A lot of times um, people are not well informed about the differences between mental health and mental illnesses. And so mental health first aid is important because it kind of teaches you um, the difference between the two as well as different things to look out for and how to empathetically care and create a safe environment for someone who's experiencing a mental health crisis. People with mental problems often do not seek help. It probably goes to um, stems from stigma, it could stem from um, a lot of different things, um, you know, the judgment, um, or I really don't feel like I need help. 
I can do this on my own. I was, you know, taught to handle my situations on my own or maybe, um, you know, through faith based means. Um, so they really don't all, you know, seek help. Um, and so that's why, again, mental health first aid is really important to help you to help them to look beyond any of these challenges so that they can receive the appropriate help that is needed. So what is a mental disorder? Um, a mental disorder, it affects the way that people think, how they cognize, how they process. Um, it affects their emotional state. Their, you, you might notice that their emotions are imbalanced. Some, sometimes they are um, really happy, um, their mood is stable, and then the very next day or even in the same day, a couple of hours later, they seem really down and depressed or angry. Um, so that kind of describes their emotional state. Their emotional state is kind of like a roller coaster. And obviously, um, a diagnosis, a mental illness um, affects behavior. Um, you may see an increase in somebody's behavior that um, may not necessarily have demonstrated those symptoms or behaviors before, which lets you know that something is not, you know, something is not right. Um, a mental health disorder or mental illness obviously will affect the way that a person works, how they carry out their day-to-day -day, um, activities, and how they engage in relationships that should be satisfying. And that's just not inside of the work environment, but in their personal lives and um, then their, how they engage with um, people on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, untreated um, mental illness and, and an untreated mental disorder will significantly impact a person's lives. And those are just a few um, points of how it disrupts it, but really there are so many different ways that um, it interrupts the, the positive flow and the seamless flow of someone's life. So let's talk a little bit about the impact of mental illness. <clears throat> He's up. So a disability refers to the amount of disruption um, a health problem causes to, to a person's ability to work, as we mentioned, carry out those daily activities and have good relationships. Um, mental illnesses can be more disabling than any chronic physical illness. For example, the disability from a moderate depression is similar to the impact from relapsing multiple sclerosis, severe asthma, or hep B. Um, I always tell people that mental illness is as serious as a physical illness. Um, a lot of times people try to separate and, you know, they'll say, oh, well, diabetes is you know, because it's a medical condition, it is much more severe than having a major depressive disorder or schizophrenia or something like that. But no, absolutely not. Please note, please note and remember that mental illness is as serious as a physical illness because it can be debilitating in so many different ways. It's, um, and just like, you know, there are certain things with a diabetic that they can or cannot do or um, can or cannot um, um, consume because it affects their blood sugar, which affects their A1C. It's the same thing with mental illnesses. It's the same thing with, um, you know, someone who has an eating disorder or any of the other um, disorders that I mentioned before. There are things that have to be carefully in place so that person can get the help that they need so that um, the mental illness or the, the diagnosis does not um, exacerbate into something that is uncontrollable or um, may have fatal consequences. So recovery from a mental illness. Recovery is the process in which People are to live, work, learn, and participate fully in their communities. What is important to note about recovery is that at the end of the day, whatever we are doing to provide immediate aid to that person until they can receive uh, further treatment um, um, from whatever their experience, crisis they're experiencing, is that our idea is we want to be able to do the best job of being empathetic, providing a safe environment for that person, um, kind of walking through the steps of providing that mental health uh, first aid so that the end goal will be, and, and then and handing them off in a way, and I don't mean to sound insensitive, but 
at the point in time where it's time to, you know, um, transfer them to a, a, a professional who can help them. We want our end goal for that person to be to be able to recover and re-enter society, um, their jobs, their working environment, their personal relationships, being fully integrated back into those um, into those different areas of their life without having um, significant challenges. So that's what recovery is. We want them to be able to enter society um, and having the skills that they need um, to maneuver and work through life should any further um, circumstances present. For some, this is the ability to, to live a fulfilling and productive life despite a disability. For others, recovery implies a reduction or complete remission of symptoms. And this information was gathered from the President's new Freedom Commission on Mental Health. All right, so mental health first aid, what is the action plan? What are we looking to do here? So the acronym is really pronounced ALGI. The A stands for assess for a risk of suicide. The L stands for listen non-judgmentally. The G stands for give reassurance and information. The E stands for encourage appropriate professional help. And then the other E stands for encourage self-help and other support strategies. So before we go um, more deeply into algae, let's talk a little bit about depression and anxiety. These are uh, two of the most common mental illnesses, and especially in the day and times that we're living in now, we're um, making it through a pandemic, we're making it through um, a lot of different circumstances that are going on in our lives personally, globally. Um, we see an increase of depression and anxiety in our neighbors and ourselves. Um, and our colleagues. And so it's really important that we're able to identify some of the symptoms for these common illnesses um, as they frequently occur in us and in, um, I would say, just, just about anyone these days, even our students. So depression. Um, major depressive disorder can last at least two weeks and affect a person's emotions, thinking, behavior, and physical well-being. It also uh, may affect the person's ability to work and have satisfying relationships, um, and as well as carry out daily activities, which we mentioned earlier. I get asked a lot, what's the difference between depression and sadness? Well, normally, if someone is sad consistently for two weeks or more, um, we will consider that that is depression. Um, so if someone is sad off and on um, or you're feeling sad today, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're depressed. But if you're displaying that sadness along with other symptoms, um, maybe not engaging in activities that you would normally engage in, um, crying, um, sleeping, um, over oversleeping, anger, um, those types of things, changes to your um, to your eating habits, we evaluate those things as professionals and we will decide whether or not that's, you know, depression. So for you as someone who's administering um, mental health first aid, you're, you're looking at and asking questions or observing, I would say, their emotions, how they're thinking, their behavior, um, things of that nature. Um, not to provide a diagnosis. And with mental health first aid, you're not providing a diagnosis at all. Just like with medical first aid, you're not saying, okay, because this person fell and it looks like they've broken their leg, they have da 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 That's not the expectation here. It's not to provide a diagnosis for anyone, but you're observing their emotions. Again, they're thinking how they're behaving, um, and then you can pass that information on to um, whomever is the professional that will um, continue to see that particular person. So anxiety, signs and symptoms. Some physical um, symptoms of someone that is struggling from anxiety would be that cardiovascular, maybe you know chest pain, rapid heartbeat, um, blushing, um, respiratory, very fast breathing or shortness of breath. A lot of times um, you will see someone who may be experiencing a shortness of breath, um, excuse me, a panic attack, I describe it as I can't breathe, my breath is short, I can't, you know, it feels like I'm having a heart attack or something. It's really hard for me to breathe. 
um, neuro neurologically, um, you'll see dizziness, a headache. Um, they'll describe a headache, sweating, um, tingling, or numbness in the body. Or if they're just complaining about stomach problems, um, you might see diarrhea, or, or they may describe diarrhea, vomiting, feeling nauseous, having a really dry mouth. And with their muscles, do they may describe, you know, having achy muscles, um, tremors, or you know, shaking, really feeling really restlessness, um, but the inability to relax is something that you um, you may be you may see more of or hear them report of more of that it's hard for me to relax. I just can't. I'm always worrying, thinking those types of things. So when we think about um, a mental health first aid, we think about having an action plan. Our first is assessment. And so we're assessing for risk of suicide or harm. Again, we're listening non-judgmentally, giving reassurance and information, encouraging professional help, encouraging self-help and other support strategies. Okay, let's talk about assessing for risk of harm for suicide. Some of the most common cases um, to assess for are gonna be depressive and anxiety symptoms, but they're related to maybe a person um, deciding that they want to um, take their lives. So uh, first thing that we want to acknowledge is the language of someone who might be suicidal. We don't use a lot, we don't say, um, or we try not to say, um, oh, I'm gonna help you because it looks like you wanna commit suicide. We don't use the word commit because um, someone who is who has decided or has, or, or is entertaining thoughts of taking their lives, um, they're not, that's not a crime. And so when you think about the word commit, it sounds like, oh, you committed a crime and no one commits. And this is just, like I said, mental health, um, issues are just like physical health issues. And so we never say, oh, someone committed cancer. We never say someone committed diabetes. And so we're not going to say that someone is, you know, um, committing suicide or, or I think that you're going to commit suicide. Um, and that's just insensitive language to use. So you can say, you know, uh, harming themselves or they may have a plan. Using language like that kind of helps to to break that barrier. Um, with that person, and then it also is more empathetic and non-judgmental. So um, some sim symptoms are um, suicidal thoughts or ideations and behaviors. And what do those behaviors may look like um, for someone who is suicidal? Say, for instance, the person is a well-known photographer, loves photography, is, is known for their, um, their work. They are now giving away their possessions. They are now giving away their cameras their, um, some of their most um, prized photos. So that's a problem. That's an unusual behavior. It's a red flag. Um, and that can let you know that someone is um, maybe experiencing suicidal thoughts. Um, and they may also experience non-suicidal self-injury. So not everyone who, um, who cuts themselves or um, who tries to injure themselves is trying to take their lives. Um, sometimes for them, the, the cutting um, or the burning or whatever they're doing to self-injure themselves might just be, I'm in pain, and this is the way that I am trying to escape from the emotional pain that I am experiencing. So there is a difference in that. Here's some warning signs of suicide. And I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, of course, this PowerPoint is here for you. All up on the screen. Oh. So some warning signs, obviously, if they're threatening to hurt or, or kill themselves, if they're seeking access to means, and means um, is um, related to like a firearm or something like that, or um, you know, rope or something that could they could use to actually um, carry out their plan. Um, if they're talking or writing about anything on social media, that's a big one. Sometimes they do that. Um, sometimes people will not do that. Um, I think about, I think I read a statistic that said about 14% of the population actually 
you know, leave some sort of note or notice, you know, and that's just not on social media, but just in general, that they're going to take their life. Um, feelings of hopelessness, feelings like they're not worth um, much or anything to this world, if they feel trapped, or even if they have a dramatic change in their mood, um, their mood goes from extremely happy to, you know, I am not, you know, I'm calling out from work, I'm not answering the calls, um, you know, not eating, um, very depressed mood. Um, my, the language has changed from, you know, feeling, you know, good about life and motivated about life to what if I was not here, um, things would be better off. Those types of things um, are all warning signs of someone who may be considering suicide. And there may be some other um, the other things that are not mentioned on the slide that you've encountered or have heard just throughout life um, that might show that there is a sign of a person wanting to um, take their lives by suicide. So what do you do when you're performing mental health first aid? How do you, how do you help? What kind of questions do you ask? First of all, you always wanna be direct. Don't feel as if though you are infringing or you're gonna make the person upset or you're doing something wrong. You need to be direct because how, how do you know whether or not this is serious, how serious this is if you're not asking direct questions? So it's okay to say, are you having thoughts of suicide? Are you planning on taking your life? Are you thinking about killing yourself? And if you're not comfortable with saying killing yourself, are you thinking about harming yourself? Or again, are you thinking about taking your life? If either of those questions is yes, then you wanna ask the person if they have a plan. It's really simple, be direct with them, ask them if they have a plan of how they are going to take their lives. Thank you. You can ask, have you decided on how you're going to kill yourself? Have you decided when you would do it? Because you're asking, you want to know a time frame, especially when you're sending this information in or relaying it to professional. When have you decided to do this? Maybe they have decided they're going to do that later on that night while everyone is asleep. We want to know specific things. How are you going to kill yourself? What is your plan for doing it? And when are you considered doing it? Um, you can also ask, have you collected things you need to carry out your plan? What you're basically asking them is, do you have, um, if you're, you know, if they, just, if they said that they are, yes, I am going to, um, I decided how I'm going to kill myself and that's, I, I'm going to take my life by, you know, um, using a firearm. Well, that last question is going to say, Did you, do you already have it in your possession? You're asking them, do you have all of what you think you need in order to carry out your plan. And that also helps you as um, administering first aid mental health to really understand the level and the nature of this crisis that the person is going through. Above all else, you wanna make sure that that person is kept safe. Um, providing a safety contact number is important. Helping the person identify past supports like Okay, so I know you mentioned like these thoughts, you know, they, they happened three years ago, but you never acted on it. Who was the person or what happened that caused you not to act on it? Was there someone that was there that supported you? Were you talking to someone, you know, like a support group or did you call like a 1-800 number? Like, you know, tell me what, what supports you had before. And then it's okay to say to that person, you know what? Let's see if those same supports can help. Let's try those same supports to keep you safe. And then that helps that person not only to feel as if though you are creating, you as the person who's administering the mental health first aid is just making all the decisions for them. But when you're asking these questions to keep them safe and getting their advice and letting them talk you through what happened, um, you know, what happened in the past and how they were able to make it through it, it helps them feel like they're a part of this process too. And it gives them more buy-in to say, okay, well, that did work the last time. Maybe I can 
fall back on those same resources to help me now. Involve them in the decision making. We just went over that. So you want to call law enforcement immediately. The person has a weapon or is behaving aggressively. Um, obviously, you want to keep them safe, but you also, number one, want to keep yourself safe. So if someone has a weapon on them um, or is behaving aggressively, they're starting to throw chairs around or, you know, punch walls or something like that. Um, this is a situation where you need to make sure that you both are kept safely and you should follow protocol in doing so. There is no reason for you to try to comfort them by, you know, maybe putting your hands on them or, you know, just to try to restrain the behavior. At this point, please, please, please follow the steps to keep yourself safe as well as that person safe. Here are some do nots when trying to keep a person safe. Do not leave an actively suicidal person alone. That is a big no-no. If you know they are suicidal, please do not leave that person alone. Right now, that is the most important thing that you have going on. Um, if you have to be late because you're, you know, in an appointment that you had scheduled right now, hanging in the balance is someone's life. And so consider to yourself the thing that I needed to do, an appointment versus someone hanging, you know, thinking about taking their lives and they are actively suicidal. That should be a no-brainer for us. But unfortunately, sometimes people feel like, oh, well, you know, they said that they were suicidal, but they said it's okay, you know, I'm going to go home, I'm going to sleep it off. Absolutely not. Do not leave someone who is suicidal alone or just accept their words that, you know, they're just going to go home and sleep it off or they're going to be okay because they've experienced this before. We do not do that. Um, do not use guilt or threats um, to prevent suicide. Don't tell them that they're going to hell, like God is not going to forgive you. Um, don't be judgmental. Don't say you're going to ruin other people's lives if you die by suicide. Um, these people, people who are suicidal, are already feeling the weight of this world inside of their mind. The heaviness of, I am going through something and I can't escape it. So the last thing that they need from someone who's supposed to be giving them help is judgment and making them feel guilty. I guarantee you that's not gonna make them feel less suicidal. Um, that's gonna put more pressure on them that I shouldn't be here because I can't even do this right, you know? Um, and so that's going to probably, you know, escalate the way that they're feeling um, and the emotions that they're feeling about taking their lives. Never agree to keep their plan a secret. Um, even as a professional, even though I'm speaking from a mental, hate, mental health uh, trainer, first aid trainer, and I am a counselor too, neither in, in either of those roles, because they're separate from me, in either of those roles, do I ever keep a plan a secret? I never say that. And as a matter of fact, when I start working with people, I tell them that if you're going to harm yourself to harm someone else, um, if you're demonstrating self um, injurious behaviors, I'm not keeping that plan a secret. I'm not keeping that a secret. I'm going to help you, but I'm not going to keep it a secret because we don't keep secrets like that. That's not helpful to the individual. So we're going to talk a little bit now about the listening non-judgmentally. You want to make sure that your attitude makes the person feel respected, accepted, and understood. Think about it every time someone has, you've told someone something and they say, oh, I'm listening, you know, let me know how you feel, da, 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 da. And all of a sudden they bring judgment on you. It doesn't feel really good, right? You kind of wish that you had never said what you said to them. Same thing here when you're providing mental health first aid. You want to be, you want to have a, an attitude that is ex, um, of acceptance. You want to be genuine and empathetic and also know that your nonverbal skills show you're actively listening. Your nonverbal skills are just as important as the skills that you're actually verbalizing. So people look at your body language and they could tell if you're interested in it, if you're not interested in it. And so your body language is just as important. You want to always be attentive, make that eye contact with them. You know, having that open body posture, you don't want to you don't want to fold your arms because it looks like you're kind of fed up, you're tired, you don't want to do any of that. Um, you want to be seated. Um, 
obviously, you know, um, if they're sitting down, you don't want to be standing over them. Um, that can be intimidating to people. So you want to kind of match their, their body language. And you want to sit next to them rather than directly opposite of them. Um, and sitting next to them kind of shows we're on mutual terms here. Um, some people might feel like if you're sitting across from them and you're looking at them, you're kind of squaring up with them. Um, and that might make them feel really uncomfortable. But if I'm sitting on the same level as you, I'm sitting next to you, it's like I, we're almost kind of going through this together. Um, we're kind of at that same level and I'm listening to you with an open heart and an open mind um, versus judging you. And do not fidget. That's hard. I know um, that one is a little, you know, especially when you're into something, we don't even notice our body language, but this is all just helping you when you're administering mental health first aid to someone um, to be more aware of yourself first so that when you are helping someone else out, um, you're not having to worry about, you know, things that might make that person um, become uh, more uneasy. So, so the G in algae stands for give reassurance and information. We just went over um, the L in algae, which is um, listening non-judgmentally. So how do you give reassurance and information? You want to treat that person again with respect and dignity. You want to understand that symptoms are an expression of distress or part of an illness. Um, and the more you understand that, the easier it is going to be to give that person that reassurance because you then understand that they're in distress. You know, something is going on. You know, red flags are popping up all over there in their minds and in their hearts and even in physical responses. And, you know, they just don't know how to get through the problems that they're expressing. Um, you want to have realistic expectations. You want to offer consistent emotional support and understanding. You may say this a million times with someone who's experiencing a, a mental health crisis. I understand. I, you know, I, I can understand that you're going through a lot right now. I can understand that, um, you know, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. You know, I'm here for you. It might sound like you're saying this a million different times, but you don't want to just say it, you want to believe it because the more that you believe it and you're expressing it and you're in the moment and you're being present with that person, it's going to help them to, um, to you know, return back to that baseline. It's going to help them to go from crisis level to hopefully back to the baseline of their just normal um, behavior and emotions. You want to give the person hope for recovery, not a promise. You don't want to promise the person you're going to recover. I, I guarantee you, you know, just, you know, you're going to recover. Everything is going to be okay. Um, and everything may be okay, but you never want to just say, I promise. Give that person hope for recovery. Um, and that can look like just saying, you know, there's so many resources out there that are available um, for you. You're not the only one. Normalize it for them. You're not the only one that's going through this. There have been, you know, a lot of people who have experienced, you um, what your experience and right now, yes, you're the most important, you know, thing to me. You're, excuse me, you're the most important person to me that's experiencing, you know, suicidal thoughts. But I want you to know that there are so many different resources out there that can help you through this process and to make you feel better. Um, provide pr pr practical help. Again, you're not treating; you're just providing help. You're providing aid. Um, again, going back to the resources, if you know about it's it's a good idea to have a toolbox of resources, um, like the our local um, Orangeburg Area Mental Health Center um, or um, other um, private um, agencies in our area, or having um, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, all these things kind of in your toolbox so that you're able to give it to them um, as a source of practical help. And you want to offer credible information. There's no reason in um, administering mental health first aid that you should be, um, you know, necessarily giving out statistics to someone who is suicidal or exp experiencing psychosis or something like that. And then you, and you're not sure the information is correct or not. As a matter of fact, I would probably wager to say, um, this is not necessarily a teaching moment um, where you're providing some all this data and research on, you know, 
um, a situ a particular illness, uh, this is a moment for you to be there and be present with the person. But when you do talk about information or if you do talk about, yeah, I noticed, you know, some signs that you're, you're demonstrating, you know, have you ever felt depressed? You don't want to start getting into information that you, if you're not really sure about that you start giving to them, because in the process of this, you're the only person at this person is really trusted to talk to about this or even has allowed into their life. So they're going to believe a lot of what you say. And we don't want what we don't want to happen is for them to find out later that some of the information that you said is not correct. So you want to stick to the script, stick to what you're supposed to be doing um, uh, so that, you know, you're not getting yourself in any sort of trouble with what by what you're saying or confusing the person that you're trying to help. So what's not supportive? You don't want to tell the person to snap out of it. That's so insensitive. You don't want to tell the person, you know, this already happened. Why are you still, you know, affected by it? You don't want to use that. You don't want to act hostile or sarcastic with them or blame the person for them some, their symptoms. Well, you know, if you weren't, you know, hanging out with so-and-so, this would not have happened because, you know, that person does the same thing. Um, adopt an over-involved or overprotective attitude. Be very careful with that, um, especially after the person has been um, recommended for treatment and by to a professional. At this point, um, there is no need to continue to stay in contact with that person. Um, you know, being overly involved with what's going on. Again, you are providing that initial um, service until. Um, you know, professional help is there for them. So be careful with adopting a mindset of I need to stay over involved. I need to, you know, continue with this or even an overprotective attitude um, with that person. You don't want to nag them um, about what he or she should do or what you would normally do in a situation like that. That's not supportive. You don't want to trivialize and minimize that person's experience like, well, you know, you know, people, go, there are people out there who are struggling with far worse things than you are. Huh? We don't want to say that because right now, whatever that crisis is, is the most important thing in that person's world. And so we don't want to do that. Neither do we want to belittle or dismiss their feelings or speak in a patronizing tone to them. That's unnecessary. We don't want to try to cure the person. Again, you're not treating them as, as, as far as providing a diagnosis or, you know, um, an, a, a treatment plan or anything like that, that is not your job when you're administering first aid mental health. Okay, so the first E in the algae model is encourage appropriate professional help. This is really important. And when I talked about professionals before, I didn't want to um, make it seem or offend anybody as if though you're not a professional. You may, you're a professional educator. You're a professional at what you do. You're certified. Um, some of you um, who are look, watching this have PhDs and um, EDD. So I'm not saying that you're not um, a pro pro professional. But when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about doctors, psychiatrists who are medical doctors, um, social workers, counselors, other mental health professionals, or certified peer specialists. These are the people that we want to encourage pro pro professional help. These are the people that we want to be able to have a seamless pass off once we are done um, getting their initial crisis situation under control. Um, types of professional help that you would tell them about, you know, is, you know, obviously therapy, there's talk therapy, but there are many different types of therapies um, that are out there. So you want to recommend, you know, the professional help would be like counseling or therapy. Um, doctors, um, I would allow the doctors, because sometimes people get a little skittish when you say, okay, well, you know, maybe you need medication. You don't have to say that. That's, you don't have to say that because, again, you're not treating um, and you don't know that, that they're going to need medication. But when they do speak with a doctor or a psychiatrist or a, a, a licensed mental professional, they can, you know, say um, whether or not um, or talk to them about the possibility of medication and what that might look like, right? Ask any other questions. And other professional supports might be groups that they can join inside of the community that is related to their particular situation. Um, so those are some other professional supports. So the way we think can influence how we feel. 
um, just keep this in mind when working with um, with working with individuals um, with mental health first aid. You know, so some people might consider a situation in a completely different way. So this cartoon is these are people waiting for the bus stop, and the first person says, "This bus is late." Bah! He's upset. The bus is late, and he'll take the only seat. This is what the lady next is thinking. The third person thinks, the bus is late, and I know the driver won't break the 20. And then the kid at the end is saying, hooray, the bus is late. So what we think can influence how we feel, and even a step greater than what we think can influence how we feel, what we think influences how we feel, and what we feel influences how we behave like what we demonstrate, the behavior that we demonstrate, if we're angry, if we're upset, um, if we're happy about different things. So realize that when people are experiencing a crisis, it may be completely different from what you're thinking a crisis is. It may be completely different from, um, you know, what um, that person's expectation of treatment is looking like. Maybe they just want someone to listen Maybe they, you know, maybe they do want to go to the emergency room because it's like these thoughts are so uncontrollable. I don't know if I'm, you know, what I'm going to do. But for you administering mental health first aid to someone, consider that. Consider that if they're behaving a certain way, it's because of a feeling that they're having. And if they're feeling a certain way, it's because they're already thinking thoughts in their mind that have probably been ruminating in their mind. And so all those things affect and they counteract and they interact with each other. And that's how we, you know, people become in crisis, crisis situations um, or not. So really consider those things. The other E is in the last E in algae, the algae model is to encourage self-help and other support strategies. So it's really important when you're doing mental health, um, and I know I've said this a million times, it's really important, but let's talk about you for a moment. So people who provide first uh, mental health first aid, um, sometimes these people, and you, we, we, we probably have um, seen them before, especially like with 9-11 or major, um, you know, disasters or uh, um, catastrophes in this world. We have, you know, the Red Cross may send out people who do mental health first aid and, you know, or even uh, if they're like tragedies at schools or something, they have, you know, obviously counselors and mental health professionals, but they also have people come in just to do that mental health first aid after the crisis has occurred. And a lot of times what happens to us is secondary traumatic stress, if we're not careful. Um, while providing mental health first aid, especially if it is right after a huge crisis that is affecting a lot of people, um, secondary traumatic stress um, or vicarious traumatization is like you're hearing these stories over and over and over again, or these people people's account of how they experienced the crisis and what happened in the crisis, and you know, and so you hear it over and over again that you then start to process and cognize their stories. And so that causes the, your, you know, that causes stress inside of yourself and it causes burnout. So you really have to protect yourself. If you want to be effective at, um, as being a mental health first aider, you have to be intentional about your self care. So you want to try to exercise, relax and meditate. Relaxation and meditation is so important. It's going to look differently for a lot of people but for meditation, for me, I am alone. I have been intentional about telling my family that from this time to this time, I'm going to be taking a break and I am doing things that are going to help my mental well-being to, you know, to boost my mental well-being um, back to where it should be. Finding peer support groups, really important. People who may be doing the same type of work that you do or not necessarily even mental first aid um, you know, maybe it is just a, a support group for, um, you know, it could be a book club or something like that that's going to kind of help one to take your mind away from it, but it's also going to help to replenish you and your skills. Um, Self-help books um, based on CBT, um, they're always helpful because that's working with your mind. It's working how we talked about thought, um, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors just now with the other slide. It's the same thing with that's CBT. 
um, cognitive behavioral therapy. So books, self-help books that are going to help you with that and self-regulating yourself and in your mind and your thoughts will also be beneficial. Um, of course, your family, friends, your faith, if you're a spiritual person, that will also help. Um, and any other social networks that are going to be supportive um, is important to make sure that you stay connected to. So just some other ways to help, um, you know, in general, um, you want to always express concern and your willingness to help. You know, asking a person, ask the person, ask whether the person knows what is or has happened to them. You're just engaging them. Um, and if you don't know, say, for instance, if they're having a panic attack, if you don't know what's going on, you can always check for a medical alert. I have one in my phone. I have... Um, diabetes. And so if something happens to me, I have um, something in my phone with my medical alert of who to contact, my emergency contact, things of that nature. Um, and if a person is experiencing, um, say, like a panic attack again, you know, again, just, you know, reassure them um, that, um, you know, you're with them. And, you know, if the person needs help, that you're going to, you know, make sure that you connect them to someone that can help them. Um, so that's the end of the presentation on mental health first aid. We really need to do a part two and three of this because it goes into suicide. It goes into psychosis and some other things. It's a really, 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 really um, important training, but it's power packed with tools that you can use in order to um, help someone who is experiencing a crisis. And guess what? You don't have to be certified to do this. You just have to be someone who cares about someone or some some someone um, in your life. It could be a student. It could be, you know, someone in your community, your church, a colleague. That's all you have to be is a willing to help, willing to follow that algae model. Um, and that's it. So um, I do have a survey and I'd like for you to fill it out, please. If you could just grab your phone and you um, place your phone over this QR code. A survey will pop up at the top. You can click on it and fill it out. Um, but again, as I mentioned, we will have to do a part two and three of the mental health first aid. This was just a baseline of some things that you can do when trying to help someone who is in crisis. And as promised, here's my um, contact information. Um, so if anyone needs to contact me about something that was discussed today or when part two or three is coming out, hold me accountable. Um, this is my information right here and I will be more than happy to discuss this with you. Thank you so much for your time and attention.